Hello everyone, welcome to another lecture uh, of uh, Foundations of Computer Science. We are going to start chapter number 5 today which is about uh, computer organization. So we are going to study in this particular chapter that uh, you know how different components of a computer are organized, what are those components called, what are the subcomponents of those and uh, how does the interaction between all the components takes place and how does computer uh, execute uh, instruction uh, if organized in a in a in a particular way so we'll start uh, with the very basics and then we'll go on into uh, deep details so starting with the uh, uh, systems the uh, subsystems in a computer so a computer hardware uh, could be divided into three components so this is the basic uh, construction of any any computer so this is how it is organized so you have the central processing unit also called the CPU we have the memory which is called the main memory or also called the RAM and then you have the input output subsystem which is basically all the systems uh, which are connected to both of these and uh, these are either used to give input to the system or they may be used for giving the output to the system now the CPU you might have heard the name already so this is used for you know processing everything uh, that you might be processing the memory is used uh, which is RAM for temporary holding the data that you uh, you know might be working on and then uh, in input output system you have the keyboard monitor printer, hard drive or any other uh, system which you can use uh, for getting the input or saving for saving your uh, output. We will go through all of these components uh, one by one in detail. Okay, Starting with the central processing unit. So a central processing unit can be divided into three main parts. We have the arithmetic logic unit also called ALU. We have a control unit which is used for controlling uh, you know, all the operations that is uh, uh, between the memory and the CPU or between the input out devices and the CPU and uh, the third one is the registers now these are some fast memory locations that we have inside CPU for uh, storing the data temporarily while CPU works on a data so for example uh, uh, so we have a memory here which is the external memory and CPU normally contacts it then within CPU also we have a small memory and the memory we have inside CPU that is called what that is basically in the form of registers so registers are memory locations inside CPU which are fast memory locations as compared to the uh, RAM that we might have so this is the organization of uh, the uh, uh, of the CPU so within CPU we have uh, ALU then we have the registers and then we have what we have the control unit the ALU arithmetic logic unit that is responsible for performing different kind of operations on the data the operations could be uh, arithmetic operations addition subtraction multiplication these could be logical operations for example AND or NOT exclusive OR that we have studied or these could uh, also be shift operations so the uh, arithmetic shift operations and the, the, the other shift operations that we uh, studied uh, in the previous lecture then the registers here these are used for storing uh, the data temporarily which we bring from the memory so once you bring the data from the memory for uh, performing some kind of you know actions so that data is temporarily stored into registers here so we have multiple registers so for let's suppose uh, uh, if we if and this R0 R1 that is basically the address of a register suppose the address of each register is 4 bits that means we will have 16 registers in that case so the registers would be from R0 R1 R2 to R16 so that depends how many uh, bits do we have uh, for each address so if the address bits are 4 bits that means to raise to power 4 you will have 16 registers if the address bit is uh, 
for example uh, 32 that means we will have what we will have uh, uh, 30 uh, we will have a uh, respirator is 5 that means we will have 32 memory locations inside the CPU so we can have a 32 bit registers or 64 these are the ones common now so if it is uh, 6 uh, address is 6 bit that means we will have 64 registers inside the CPU and then we have control unit inside control unit also we have two registers one is called the program counter the other one is called the instruction register now when we perform any operation in the arithmetic logic unit we have to bring the data and the instruction from the memory so what does program counter do program counter basically points to the next instruction in the memory so in the memory you may have many instructions which may be placed sequentially so the program counter basically tells us which instructions to bring now so when you when you get one instruction it automatically points to the next instruction the instruction that we need to bring now into the cpu and the instruction register here that is used to save the instruction so once we get the instruction from the memory pointed by pc program counter that instruction that we bring that is saved into the instruction register and the data we bring that data is saved into these data registers so these are called the data registers program counter that is used to point to the next memory location uh, from where you have to get the instruction and instruction register is used to save the instruction that we get from the memory so what are registers? Registers are fast standalone storage locations that hold the data temporarily on which you may want to perform operation inside CPU. So multiple registers are needed to facilitate the operation of CPU. So some of the registers are shown. So you have the data registers and then you have the instruction register and program counter uh, both of which were part of actually the control unit. So data registers are used just to store the data and they are normally referred to as RAR0, R1 and they may go up to RN. Then you have the instruction register which is used to hold the current instruction that you are going to execute. The program counter points to the memory location, next memory location from where you have to bring the instruction. So what is the role of control unit here? The control unit uh, controls the operation of each subsystem so you have three subsystems that we have discussed the memory IO subsystem and the uh, and the CPU so the, the, that is the role of control unit that it basically controls when to get the data from the memory when to get the data from the IO uh, subsystem when to write the data to the memory or write the data to the uh, to the IO uh, input output subsystem so when to do what that is controlled by what that is controlled by the control unit now the controlling is achieved through signals these which are sent from the control unit to other subsystems. So depending on what kind of code is sent by the control unit we would know what kind of uh, uh, operation we have to perform and where do we have to perform the operation. Okay, next is the main memory. So uh, this is an example of the main memory which is also called RAM. So today a common uh, size of the memory is 4 gigabytes, 8 gigabytes, 16 gigabytes, 32 is also used. So these are common uh, you know, sizes of the main memory also called the random access memory. So this is how a memory is uh, normally represented in a computer. So you have the memory here. Inside the memory what do you do? You store some kind of data and that data is stored in uh, you know small chunks of information. So that chunks that you have, they could be 8 bits, they could be 16 bits or 32 bits or 64 bits, that depends. For example, you could see here that in this case, this particular memory location that we have here, that is saving how much uh, bits, that is saving actually how many bits, it is saving 16 bits. Now the data that you save here, that is called a word. So a word could be either 8 bits that is 1 byte or it could be 16 bits that is 2 bytes or 4 bytes or 8 bytes as well. So that means word, this is called a word, a word can have uh, different kind of sizes. Now each, wo each word that you have 
may have different sizes each word is basically addressed by a an address so if you want to go to a particular memory location what do you have to do you have to go through an address so address basically tells us which particular word you want to extract so the address actually specifies how many words you may have so for example in this case you could see that the address is basically 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 so it is 10 bits so if it is 10 bits that means it is 2 raised to power it how many uh, addresses we will have that means we will have 2 raised to power 10 addresses so how many memory locations we will have we will have 2 raised to power 10 which is 1024 so we will have 1024 memory locations here and each memory location is having what each memory location is having 2 bytes or 16 bits so if each memory location is having 2 bytes and we have how many memory locations 1024 so you can multiply 1024 with 2 so that would mean uh, how many we have we have uh, 2048 so 1024 multiplied with 2 that would mean 2048 bytes you will have we have 1024 memory locations each location is taking 2 bytes so we have in total 2048 bytes now 2 raised to power 10 is actually called uh, 1 kilo and this is uh, uh, 2 bytes so that means we will have 2 kilobytes saved in this particular uh, memory uh, in this memory so how much is the data that is saved here that is basically you multiply the total number of memory locations that you have which the number of bytes in each word that you have so we have 2 raised to power 10 memory location which is 1 kilo and then we have 2 bytes in each memory location so 2 into 1 kilo that would mean you have 2 kilo bytes saved in this particular memory so the, the, the size of this memory is basically 2 kilo bytes and then it may keep on increasing so you may have you know 4 megabytes of memory or uh, 4 gigabytes of memory depending on what is the address and how many uh, bytes you have in each word so a collection of storage locations each with a unique identifier that is called an address so this is called an address which is used to identify each location now data is transferred to and from memory in groups of bits called words so the data that we transfer from the memory this is memory uh, to CPU or from memory to IO devices as well if you want so that is basically in the form of words so words basically can be a group of 8 bits, 16 bits, 32 bits or 64 bits or even more as well and uh, normally we deal in terms of bytes so 8 bits is 1 byte so we may say that a word could be of 1 byte, 2 bytes, 4 bytes or 8 bytes if the word is 8 bits it is referred to as byte so the term byte is more common in computer science so we may have a 16 bit, uh, bit word also called a 2 byte word or a 32 bit word also called as 4 byte word to, to, to access a word in the memory so we need an identifier so uh, programmers use a name to identify a word and that is basically the address at the hardware level each identified each word is identified by address so total number of uniquely identified locations in the memory that is called the address space so that is basically the address space that you have so how many addresses we had here 2 raised to power 10 so that is our address space the address space along with the word size determines the memory size so uh, these are the units that we normally use in computers so the, which is uh, normally different to the uh, units that we normally use for you know other uh, units in daily life so for example a kilo in daily life is basically 1000 so 10 raised to power 3 it is you may have kilometers we may have kilograms and others so that is basically 10 raised to power 3 of the basic unit which is 1000 of the basic unit so a kilogram is 1000 gram and a kilometer is 1000 meters so a kilobyte might seem as 10 raised to power 3 or 1000 bytes but normally this is not the case for computer because in computer we always deal with binary numbers we always go in power of 2 
so instead of 1000 in computer a kilo is basically not 1000 bytes that is 1024 bytes and normally we use the exact uh, uh, you know bytes rather than using the approximation so we can use approximation in some uh, calculation you might see some approximations as well but generally uh, in most of the examples and practically we use the exact number of bytes then for mega it is 10 raised to power 6 normally and in computer it is 2 raised to power 20 so 2 raised to power 10 that is uh, uh, the kilo and 2 raised to power 20 that is mega 2 raised to power 30 is giga which is 10 raised to power 9 and Tara is 10 raised to power 12 which is 2 raised to power 40 bytes so these are the exact number of bytes that we have and these are the approximations that we use in the real uh, life so the memory addresses are defined using unsigned binary integer because the addresses cannot be negative addresses are always positive so that is why we do not use the signed numbers for addresses we always use the unsigned binary integers for the addresses Okay, we have a couple of examples here uh, uh, for the relations of uh, the memory and uh, addresses and the words. So let us first go back here and you know let me explain to you that how it works again so that we can start solve the examples. So first you need to know how many addresses there are and you need to know how many words in uh, how many bytes in each word that could be used to get the total size of the memory now in a problem you might be given any one of the three so you have the total addresses or number of bytes in word or the size of the memory so you can multiply the address total number of addresses with the bytes in each word to get the total size of the memory so for example if you have uh, uh, 16 addresses and then you have two bytes in each address so that means you will have 16 into 2 32 bytes and if you are given the total memory for example and the bytes in each word so then in that case you can divide the memory by the bytes in each word to get the total number of addresses so you multiply address with the bytes in word to get the memory or if you are given memory and address then you have to divide memory with the address or if you are given the bytes in the word then you have to divide memory by bytes to get the addresses so this is how it would work so let us look at the example so a computer has 32 megabytes of memory it says how many bits are needed to address any single byte in memory so coming back here so it says there are that the memory size is what that is 32 megabyte and it also tells us that we have one byte here because it is telling us we need uh, what we need the bits needed to address the memory if there is single byte in the memory so we have a single byte in the memory so we have the single byte here in the memory and we, we need to find out uh, you know how many bits are needed for the memory so first we want to find out that uh, you know uh, how many uh, can we represent this uh, memory that is in megabytes can we represent in the form of 2 and then we can find out that you know how many bytes we do we need because we know that each word in here is actually only one byte so when we say megabytes here so if we can find out you know this particular value 32 mega by 32 mega if you can find out the 32 mega then this automatically refers, refers to what this automatically represents to byte so you need to divide by 1 in this case 32 megabyte needs to divide by 1 so since 1 uh, uh, if you divide anything by 1 doesn't really make any difference so that is why uh, you know we simply need to solve for this 32 mega if you add 2 bytes here then you will divide 32 megabyte by 2 but now since we have 1 byte so we don't need to divide by anything so we just need to solve this 32 megabyte divided by single byte so that means 32 m 32 mega that is the total number of addresses so how many addresses we have 32 mega now if I want to find the number of bits so we need to convert that 32 mega into 10 raised to power then we would know how many bits there are so for example if I know that there are 16 memory locations so I need to find out how many bits there are so I may need to take the log logarithm base 2 of that that is one way to do that 
so for example 32 mega so mega i know that is 2 raised to power what that is 2 raised to power 20 so i can uh, divide 32 into 2 raised to power 20 i take i can take the log base 2 of that and that will give me the number of bits another way could be i can simply write all of this in the power of 2 so the memory address space is 32 megabytes mega is 2 raised to power 20 so mega is what that is 2 raised to power 20 so mega could be written as 2 raised to power 20 what about 32 32 is actually 2 raised to power 5 so you have 2 raised to power 5 for 32 2 raised to power 20 for mega so this becomes actually 2 raised to power 25 so that means we need what we need actually 25 bits to represent one address and one address contains one byte so that means we need 25 bits to represent one byte if we have 32 megabytes of memory where each memory location is saving only one particular byte so as I said what do you need to do in a problem so if you have the memory then you might be asked either to find out the addresses or the number of bits in addresses that is something related to address or you might be asked how many bytes there are in each word so what do you need to do you simply have to divide the memory with either the number of bytes you have or the number of addresses you have so how many bytes you have you have one byte so you simply need to divide by one so it won't make any difference then you need uh, uh, you know you only need 32 mega addresses 32 mega addresses that is the total number of addresses we need to have the number of bits per address so you can take the log base 2 of 32 mega and we can also you know convert that using this uh, particular way as well so if you have a calculator then you can simply take the log base 2 of 32 mega that will give you 25 another uh, example so a computer has 128 megabytes of memory so again mega uh, memory is given so that means we need to divide then it says each word in this computer is 8 bytes so previously we had 1 byte now it says 8 bytes so that means each memory location has what that has 8 bytes then again it asks, it asks us how many bits are needed to address any single word in the memory so we need to find out again the number of bits for each memory location so first we can find out the total number of memory locations and then we can you know take the log base 2 of that to get the bits in the memory location so we have 128 megabytes of memory and 8 bytes in every you know uh, in every word so we can divide 128 mega by 8 bytes so if you divide 128 by 8 so what does that give you so that will actually give you uh, so this will be 16 megabytes actually if you divide 120 megabyte by 8 so that will give you what that will give you the 16 mega memory locations you can either do that or you can convert this into power of 2 and this one into 2 raised to power 2 and can directly find out the memory location so for example you could see here that you have 128 mega 128 mega is same as 2 raised to power 27 how mega is 2 raised to power 20 128 is 2 raised to power 7 so that means this is actually 2 raised to power 27 and then you have 8 uh, bytes in the word uh, in each word so that is 2 raised to power 3 so since you have to divide 128 mega by 8 so that means you can divide 227 by 2 raised to power 3 because 8 is 2 raised to power 3 so if you divide 227 by 2 raised to power 3 you get 2 raised to power 24 which is actually uh, same as uh, uh, 16 mega so here this can be represented as what 24 bits because 16 mega could be written as 2 raised to power 4 and 2 raised to power 20 so which is same as 2 raised to power 24 so that is 24 bits so you need how many bits 24 bits for each address in this particular case so these are the examples for the memory so in the exam you might be given any one of these so might you might be given the total number of bits for each address so you can find out how many addresses there are and then you may be given the total bytes in each word so you can multiply the two to get the total size of the memory or you may be given any one of these uh, you know values uh, out of these three and then you can find the the last value okay what are the memory types that we have so we have uh, two kind of types we have the ram and the rom RAM is the random access memory and the other one is read and the memory. 
Now both of these are actually random access memories. So for example RAM, the memory that we have can be accessed randomly. So that means you don't have to go sequentially. You can get any block of the RAM uh, directly, you know, randomly as well. The same is the case with the ROM as well that you can directly jump to any location of read-only memory and extract that particular uh, memory. Now random access memory and read-only memory they actually differ in that the random access memory is volatile and read-only memory that is non-volatile. So if you have RAM, RAM is uh, something that if you take the power off any data in the RAM that will be lost. So for example if you are working on a computer and you don't save whatever you are working on and you simply take the power off and let's suppose if it is not a laptop you are using some other computer with no power backup. So if the computer is shut down anything that you are working in that might be lost because RAM, RAM does not actually store it. So any data that is in RAM that is actually stored. So sometimes you may see that when you uh, you know suddenly the computer turns off and you open so your computer actually has to have uh, uh, some kind of you know old, old copy of some file that you may be working on now that file is not actually stored in RAM so some of the latest operating system they temporarily keep on storing a file you are working on you know in some kind of temporary files on the hard disk so when you reload so they basically say that this was something that you may not have saved so do you want to recover it but that is not saved in RAM that is saved in some kind of hardware by the you know intelligent operating system but generally if you don't save it if it is in your RAM so any data that may be in the RAM that will be lost now within RAM we have two kind of memories we have static RAM and we have dynamic RAM also called as SRAM and DRAM the static RAM is basically a RAM which works on logic gates so it has you know the AND gates and all other gates so these gates uh, which basically then make transistors are used to store values either one or zeros. Now the SRAM basically does not store anything so you have a constant power through that power it stores you know the values if you take the power off everything is lost and uh, since uh, the values here are stored in transistors so there is no refresh sorry the refreshing is not required so you don't need to you know uh, refresh the memory once there is something in the memory that will be in the memory so SRAM is actually much faster based on transistors it is much faster but expensive then you have the DRAM the DRAM uh, it is based on capacitors so if you have worked in electronics you would know that capacitors could be charged and then the capacitors are also get discharged so the charging of a capacitor could be used to store one value that is one and this charging could be used to store the other value that is zero. So if the capacitor is charged that is one otherwise it is zero. Now the capacitor uh, you know has the tendency of leaking the, uh, uh, the, the, the energy it has stored. So that means the charge that is stored in capacitor that may be leaked over time. So in the case of DRAM you may have to refresh it after you know certain time. Otherwise uh, let's suppose if you have stored a one as a charge on the capacitor the charge may be leaked and it may be converted to zero so you need to refresh it after every time after a few you know moments of time so DRAM it is actually cheaper but it is uh, you know less faster because it uses capacitor and then you have to keep on refreshing it after you know every moments of time so depending on uh, where exactly you want to use it so you can either use the DRAM which is slower but uh, you know cheaper and or you can use the SRAM which is faster but uh, more expensive. Now we normally use the memory in, in hierarchies so uh, for example uh, we may have some part used as SRAM so it will be a small memory so we don't have to you know spend a lot but at the same time it will be faster and then if you need a large memory so if you want to use SRAM it may be very expensive so for large memories you may use DRAM and if you have small memory we may use the SRAM so we'll see the hierarchy later on then you have the read-only memory the read-only memory also called ROM uh, so we have th th this is actually uh, cannot be rewritten so the, the, the data that you have in RAM you can overwrite it as well once you have written you can you know change it you can rewrite it again and again so that is possible 
But in the case of read-only memory, once it is written, generally it is not possible to change it. So where do we use it then? If you have a read-only memory, so for example, uh, you know some part of the memory in your CPU that uh, that some part of the memory uh, main memory that could be used actually as a ROM as well. Uh, so the, the the ROM is basically the the part of the memory that you cannot change. And that actually could be used in CPU for you know storing anything for the boot operating or for for anything related to the boot of the operating system. So whenever your operating system loads, so we need to boot it. So that information related to the boot could be stored in ROM so that nobody is able to actually change it. Uh, and uh, you might have seen when the computer loads, so there are some options written here that if you want to go to the boot menu, press F12 or F10. So that is actually stored in read only memory, which is related to the you know computer specification that if you want to load the operating system where it is located hardware or it is uh, located in the external drive or it is located somewhere else. So you can specify the boot options and then it also tells you, you know, a lot more information about uh, the hardware that is actually linked to this particular operating system. So all that information may be there in boot. Uh, uh, in ROM which cannot be changed. Now, uh, so generally ROM is not uh, you know changeable so it is only read only memory but then we do have some kind of ROM which could be changed. So generally when the computer is shipped so there is ROM there which has already been uh, you know written by the uh, developers and you can't change it but then we have some kind of computers uh, some system where we have uh, PROM that is programmable read only memory. So, so that particular memory is actually not uh, written, it is empty and then you may be, you know, it may be shipped to you empty and you may be given a certain device uh, through which you can actually write it on your own. So in that case you need to have, you know, that, um, uh, you know, capacity or you need to have uh, uh, experts who can actually, you know, write that memory. So you may be given the device and based on whatever you want to do, you might, uh, write that memory on your own but it will not be once you write it that then it will not be you know changeable so you will not be able to change it but you can write it on your own with a special device okay then we have erasable programmable read on the memory called eprom now erasable programmable read on the memory that not only could be read by you but it could be erased and then you could rewrite it and then you can you can use it so you can you know rewrite it as well but in the case of erasable programmable read only memory once you write your memory and you you know fix it in your system if you want to rewrite it then you will have to take it off physically from your system put it in the you know system that you use for rewriting it and after rewriting it then you will have to put it back into the system where you you know might want to use it so this is called what this is erasable programmable read only memory where you have to physically take it off then you have electrically erasable programmable read only memory eprom now this kind of memory can be erased and reprogrammed and you don't have to physically take it off you can simply use some kind of electrical signals to actually erase it and then rewrite it as well so that is called what? That is called the electrical, electrically erasable programmable read only memory. Now generally we use the um, you know uh, ROM that means our computers are shipped with the already written ROM and we can simply you know use it but we cannot erase it or we cannot change it. Okay this is the memory hierarchy that we normally have that we use uh, in our computers. So you have the main memory at the bottom then you have the cache memory and then you have the resistors. So this is the hierarchy we use. Now the main memory actually is quite large. For example, you might have you know seen the RAM. We have four giga, uh, eight giga, sixteen gig gigabytes, thirty-two gigabytes. So this is a very large amount of memory. So since uh, we have a very big memory, so that means that we will actually use a low-cost memory. Here. So it will be a slow memory, but uh, the price would be less. So for example, we might prefer to use DRAM here. Then we have the cache memory. The cache memory will be, you know, seen in a bit. It is an intermediate memory which is uh, between the main memory and the memory we have for CPU. 
So what is the memory that we have for CPU? For example, we have registers. So we have seen the data register, the program counter, instruction register, which are inside CPU. So the memory we have inside CPU, that is a very small memory. So since it is small, so we can afford it to be expensive, but faster. So the memory we use for register, that is actually more costly, but it is fastest. And the memory, as we move from uh, registers to main memory, we actually move uh, from a faster memory to a slower memory, but cheaper memory because the memory size is actually bigger. And the cache memory is in between the register and the main memory. So we have already seen the memory inside CPU, which is register. We have seen the main memory as well and its composition. Then what about the cache memory? You might have you know heard when you go to buy a computer that uh, this particular computer has uh, uh, this is a 64-bit uh, operating system, 64-bit uh, you know computer, and then it has a uh, um, 2.3 uh, processor. The processor is processor speed is actually 2.3 megahertz, and then you have what uh, you have the uh, you know cache uh, L2 cache, L3 cache of this particular size, and then also the RAM, and all these specifications are given. So what is a cache? As the name suggests, you know you might have uh, you know heard this name in browser as well. That when you're working something, let's suppose if uh, you know open a website, the next time you open a website then even if you are not connected the main page may still load because it is stored somewhere in the cache so what is the cache now the cache is basically the memory which is between the cpu and the main memory so it is not uh, as faster as the cpu memory and not as slower as the main memory and uh, not as big as the main memory and not as small as the cpu memory so it is small compared to the main memory, uh, uh, but it is uh, bigger as compared to the resistors. So what do we store in cache? So since it is faster as compared to main memory, so what do we do? We basically uh, uh, move, whenever we move some data from the main memory on which we want to perform operation in the CPU, we place that data into the cache. And then you know we can perform some operation and do everything that we want. So the next time, whenever we want to perform any operation, instead of looking into the main memory, we actually first look that first look for that and data into the cache. If that data is available in the cache, so we don't need to go to the main memory, we actually use the data from the cache because it is faster, that we will be able to do the processing faster. And if the data is not available in the cache, we go into the main memory. We get the new data, we replace the old data from the cache with the new data and then we perform the operation on the new data. So if the data is available in the cache, we don't need to go to the main memory, we simply get the data from the cache and do operation. If it is not available in the cache, we go to main memory, get the data, put that data into the cache, replace the old data and then perform the operation on the data. So next time, if the same data is requested, so we might have to you know get the data we might get the data from the cache rather than going to the main memory. Now, uh, so since every time we go, we have we, we, we have a miss hit. That means we try to get the data from the cache and it is not available. And we have to go to the main memory that may be called a miss hit because we, we actually were not able to locate the data from the cache. So what do we do? All the old data that was available in the cache that is actually replaced with the new data so if somebody is requesting one frame only and suppose we have you know three frames in the cache so what does it do does it replace only one frame or all the frame it will replace all the frames in the cache how so for example if it is you know requesting this particular frame it will copy the next two frame as well and move the, that into the cache because uh, through experiments uh, the programmers have found that uh, we have this you know 80 20 rule uh, in in actually accessing the memory that programmers have seen that 80 percent of the time whenever uh, we actually you know uh, it's only 80 percent of the times uh, that uh, we, we actually try to get the same data again and again so 80 percent of the data is uh, uh, if, if we divide the data into 80 percent and 20 percent 80 percent of the data we rarely use it's only the 20 percent data 
that we actually use again and again. So that 20% data could be moved into the cache. So if I'm accessing some data here, there are that is more likely that I may be uh, you know accessing the data just next to it next time as well. So there is only 20% of the data into the memory that we are accessing again and again. For example, if you you know talk about me, I may have a lot of data in my you know hard disk. But which data I mostly work on, there is only a limited amount of data that I actually work on on daily basis. So the same data I access again and again, uh, you know, and, and so that is the data that is actually the 20% of the data. So if that data could be moved into the cache, so that means our uh, processor might work faster. So that is the main role of the cache member. For the next topic, we have the input output subsystem. Uh, so what is input output subsystem? So we had three systems there, the, the, the CPU, the uh, main memory and I.O. subsystem. So this is the third subsystem. So the collection of devices referred to as the input output disk subsystem in a computer. These are that is called I.O. subsystem. So we communicate with the outside world uh, and to the stored program and data using the I.O. subsystem. So there are two broad categories of the I.O. subsystem. We have the non-storage and, and we have the storage devices. So what are the non-storage devices which cannot store, uh, you know, any data? So for example, non-storage devices, we have keyboard, monitor, printer. So for example, keyboard could be used to input the data. Monitor could be used to see the output on the uh, output on the screen. So both of these do not store any kind of data. Printer as well, printer does not store any data. Now the, the, the new printers might have some kind of memory there. But generally, uh, the output of the printer is not something that could be stored into the computer. So generally, if you use printer, we have some kind of paper printed out of it, which cannot be directly used into the computer. Uh, so we might have to, you know, scan it to, to get uh, it to a convertible format, which could be used uh, by the computer. Then we have the storage devices. So output of printer cannot be directly stored into the computer. So we say that it is not a storage device. Now the uh, storage devices we have, uh, we have a, uh, uh, you know, these we use to store large amount of information so that we can retrieve later on. So for example, hard disk that we have in a computer that is a storage device. So this is an output device and that we use uh, for storing information for uh, uh, so that we can retrieve at a later time even if there is no power. Because the main memory and all of the other contents they are actually non-volatile. If you take the power off everything is lost. But the uh, large amount uh, of information that we may want to save in some kind of you know memory device which may be cheaper than the uh, than the random access memory so that kind of device is called a storage device which is slower but can store large amount of information so we have two kind of storage devices uh, and uh, magnetic devices or optical devices so we'll go through these uh, one by one so magnetic devices we have either magnetic disk or we may have the magnetic tape so in a magnetic disk, how does it work? So we have the disk drive. So we have many disks in a magnetic disk. So how does it work? So each disk may have a lot of information. So for example, this is one disk. This is the top view of a disk. So each disk has many tracks. So in this particular disk, we have three tracks here. Then all of these tracks, they are separated by inter-track gap. Then these tracks are divided into different sectors. And then uh, we have, you know, the intersector gap as well, which is dividing the sector. And each sector stores a certain amount of information. So when we get the data from, uh, from a disk, we basically, you know, go to a particular sector and get the data from the sector. And then to read the data, we basically have a controller, which has a read-write head. So we may be able to read the data or we may be able to write the data on the disk drive, which is the magnetic disk drive. Now, uh, the magnetic disk drive is basically a random, uh, you know, data access dri uh, drive. How? Because we can, you know, directly move to, we can move to any of the data randomly, whichever, you know, data you want to move. And the, uh, how fast we can extract the data from the disk, that basically depends on three factors. What is, what is the speed at which this disk rotates? Because the controller is fixed and disk can rotate. So how fast the disk can rotate? That is one factor. Then we have the seek time that uh, how fast uh, the read, uh, or read, read or write controller can move to the corresponding sector 
uh, which particular sector we have to read or write and the last is basically the transfer time that is uh, how fast we can read the data and transfer it uh, to the you know memory or uh, how fast we can write the data by taking the data from the memory to the corresponding sector so these are the three factors the speed of the disk and uh, the seek time time to move to the corresponding sector and then the uh, response time or uh, that is uh, the, the, the time to read the data or time to you know, write the data on the actual uh, you know, disk sector. Then we have the magnetic tape. Uh, the magnetic tape is basically uh, we have two reels on which it is uh, it resides so when the reel moves so the magnetic tape basically moves. So we have a read write head in between so when any reel would move then uh, the, 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 this magnetic tape would actually move uh, on this read write head and as the read move as this particular magnetic tape uh, moves here so we can either read the data or we can write the data as well uh, using these heads. Now this is the uh, side view of this is the top view this is the side view of the magnetic tape. So magnetic tape is basically divided into uh, tracks, horizontal distribution here and then we have the vertical distribution. The horizontal distribution are called tracks. So we have 9 tracks here, track 1 to track 9. The 8 tracks are basically representing 8 bits or 1 byte and the last track 9 is basically 1 bit which is used for error correction. And then uh, you know the, the, these tracks are vertically divided you know to have the bits as well. And then we have multiple blocks as well in this uh, magnetic tape. Now magnetic tape, tape is not a random uh, access kind of uh, drive. Uh, if magnetic tape uh, stores the data uh, not uh, randomly but it stores the data sequentially. So for example if I have to move, uh, if I am at this block and I have uh, to move to, this, suppose this is block 1 and I have a block 3 here. If I have to move block uh, to block 3 so I will have to go to block 2 and then block 3. So the, the, the movement in uh, magnetic tape is actually sequential so it is uh, slower as compared to the magnetic disk. Okay, then we have uh, the ROMs, uh, uh, CD-ROM that is uh, the compact disk read on the memory. So which basically works on, on a laser or optics we also call that it works on optics. So we have the magnetic uh, drives and then we have the optical drives. So this uh, CD-ROM they basically store the information in some kind of optical drives. So how do we store it? So uh, we normally have a master disk. We have a plastic or gloss here. And then we have uh, pits and lands here. So what is a pit? This is basically a hole. And what is a land? This is basically the portion where we do not have a hole. So we have some holes here and then we have portions where we do not have any holes. So what do we do then? Um, so this is basically the master disk. This could be used to make a lot of disks. So how do we do that? Then we basically uh, create a mold from this master disk. So first we have to create the master disk. Then we create this uh, you know, mold. Uh, and what is the material of the mold? This is basically polycarbonate resin material. So once we create the mold, how do we create the mold? Wherever you have a pit, so you basically have you know uh, uh, this kind of tower here. And wherever you have the land, you have the hole here. So this is exactly opposite to whatever you have the master disk. So after creating this mold, we basically put our this uh, uh, polycarbonate material inside this mold. So wherever when you when you put this material inside this mold, so wherever you have uh, this uh, particular uh, uh, you know gap here, so this particular gap when you put the material here so this would result in what this would result into the land and wherever you have you know this tower here this would result into what into a pit so we can uh, get a replica of the master disk by using this mold by you know pouring a polycarbonate resin material into the mold and once we get this polycarbonate material uh, with the uh, pits and lands then we add a reflective layer here now this reflective layer that we have here, that uh, layer is uh, uh, normally made of uh, aluminum. And once uh, this, this layer is basically used for the reflection. Then we add another protective layer after the reflective layer. 
and then lastly we have a label for this particular CD. Now once we do that we basically create the CD where we have the polycarbonate resin material, we have the reflected aluminum material, we have protected layer and a label. Now how do we read it when we put this particular so suppose this is a this is the surface of a CD so when we put the CD inside a CD ROM so we have what we have a laser source and a laser detector there the laser source basically uh, puts uh, the light or laser on the surface of the CD and based on uh, the pits and the land the light would be reflected or uh, you know it may not be reflected when light falls on any land it is reflected and detected by the laser detector so that is treated as one and when light falls on a pit it is reflected twice one by the reflected rail and once by the uh, this particular um, pit as well now the size of the pit is made such that the light reflected from the pit and from the reflected rail they add up through a constructive uh, destructive uh, interference and the light basically you know uh, get cancelled and you do not get any light at, as well, at all so when there is no light at all or very low light then that means it is actually a pit so it is a zero and when there is a light reflected that means it is a one so you know all the data that is stored you know in computer that is in the form of binary numbers ones and zero so through this we get ones or zeros or our data so uh, that is how you know we can uh, read the data from a uh, compact disk so we have different kind of you know uh, compact disk uh, cd roms we have one x cd rom that is uh, 150 kb per second so the, it can read the data 150 kb per second then we have 2x which is double the speed 4x and we go up to 40x which can read up to 6 megabytes per second as well so these are the different cd rom speeds now we used to have cd roms in computer previously but nowadays uh, we rarely have the CD-ROM, the USB stick has actually taken over or uh, external hard drive a lot of people use as well so we don't uh, really use uh, you know CD-ROM uh, a lot nowadays but it could still be used uh, uh, you know for storing the data now the data that we store in CD-ROM this is how the data is stored so we have a lot of data in the CD-ROM so the data is divided into these kind of you know for in this format so we have one byte which is 8 bits then you have a symbol which is basically uh, 14 bit so we basically add 6 more bits to a byte to make one symbol and those extra 6 bits that we add that 6 bits are just used for error detection and correction so that means the data is more secure in the form of a CD because uh, if there is an error, any error that could be corrected as well by using what by using the you know the extra bits that we have added for you know error detection and correction so the original data is only 8 bits but uh, the extra 6 bits we have in symbol those are for error detection and correction then you have uh, a frame which consists of you know 42 symbols so 42 into 14 that will give you the number of bits in, in, in a frame then you have a sector which is basically you know 98 frames so you might have heard this you know for your you know old hard disk as well which used to be working on optic disk principle that there is a bad sector you know in your hard disk uh, so that actually refers to this particular sector which may be consisting of a number of frames so this is how a cd rom uh, cd is basically the, the data on the cd is uh, is uh, is placed okay then we have uh, the uh, so normally when we use uh, you know such kind of uh, structure to make a cd so that is used when you have you know to make CDs in bulk so let's suppose uh, there is a video game and uh, you want to buy that video game so since that will be uh, shared across the world so you may have to make multiple thousands or hundreds of thousands of copy of that particular CD so in that case this particular method is actually very suitable because uh, it is not cheap to have a master disk then the molding and then you know creating the disk through all of this process so this is used when you have bulk amount of series now if you want to have a small amount of series let's suppose you have some data which you want to save in a disk so in this particular case that particular method may not be suitable so for that you may have a cd uh, which is you know uh, a writable cd which, are, which is also called uh, you know uh, cdr so that is called what that is called a writable cd 
so a cd r actually could be written by your computer as well this r r stands for recordable so this is a recordable cd or writable cd uh, so what has happened in this case in this case you basically the, the difference is when you get a cd so there is a die inside the cd so that pits and holes that you have in the normal cd those are replaced by a die and then you have a reflector layer now this reflective layer is actually uh, made of uh, gold instead of aluminum so normal cd that you have you have a reflective layer made of uh, you know uh, made of aluminum but in this case the reflective layer is actually uh, from the uh, gold okay so what do we do then since we do not have any pits uh, and lands here so these pits and lands that uh, these are simulated by uh, by a die uh, simulated in the die by some kind of source here so we do have some kind of laser source a high power beam actually in uh, you know writable in a cd rom which can you know actually write data on the uh, cd as well so if you have a writable cd recordable cd so you can write the data by you know simulating pits and holes so you have a die here which uh, you know basically made of some kind of material which is used in photography so you can simulate the pits and lands so how do you can do it so you will have some kind of laser source, source which first can simulate pits and holes and then uh, uh, those uh, pits and holes uh, could be read by the laser detector and a laser source so for example it could change the formation of a die so, so there could be some chemical uh, you know changes in the die by using some you know high power laser beam and then we can have ones and zeros there then a low power laser source could be used to read the data and based on the reflection we might find out whether it is a pit or it is a land so that is called what that is actually the cdr now this uh, the size of a cd is normally small so normally we have around 700 megabytes uh, of a cd so if you uh, want to save data which is much bigger so normally you know the, the, the requirement of the data in nowadays it's uh, is getting much uh, bigger so we do need to save huge amounts of data so in that case the the uh, writable uh, uh, you know cd may not be enough so we may uh, uh, we may need bigger size as well so for a bigger size we need uh, you know not the cd we need another kind of form which is called dvd now before we go to dvd one another kind of cd that uh, uh, we also have is rewritable cd so the writable cd although we can write it on, on our own if you have to you know print or write one cd or 10 cds for a small amount this could be done but if you want if you have written it once you cannot erase it so that is permanent then so you may have to you may want to have a cd which could be rewritable multiple times so it could be you may you know rewrite that cd that is cdrw so in that case uh, the difference is that uh, uh, we instead of a die we have an alloy here and the reflective layer uh, we again have the same kind of layer now the alloy that we use here uh, that alloy is made of some certain kind of you know chemical material which could be changed by the laser and the reflective layer here that we have uh, uh, in CDRW that is uh, not made of uh, gold that is made of some composition of few metals so it is different to the you know CDR that we may have now in the case of rewritable uh, again uh, we basically have uh, some kind of uh, high power laser which can change the composition of this alloy that we have here and based on change in the chemical composition we may have some uh, you know crystalline or clear material here or some dark material here so the dark material is called the pit the clear material that is called the land or crystalline so uh, from the pit light will not be reflected from the land the light would be reflected from the reflected layer so then we can use the laser source to, to, to you know have the pits and uh, land so this is a general uh, overview of how this whole thing works so you know may not need to you know look into the details that what kind of materials there are and how do these get reflected and how we can change the chemical composition so that is not part of the course so uh, we, we have a general discussion that what 
uh, is a general composition of a CD how does it work so that this is something that you need to uh, just know okay so uh, okay then we have the DVDs as well so what is a DVD DVD is actually uh, it works similar to a CD except that it has a much bigger capacity and how does it have a bigger capacity uh, so there are few reasons for that one is that we have a much smaller sectors the size of the pits and land is smaller so the size of pits and land is smaller then of course frames are smaller and then the sectors are smaller as well so that means you can store much bigger information much more information uh, in the same size so that is how you get more uh, capacity it is much faster as well because the laser beam that is used uh, in DVD that is actually different to the one used in the series if you have worked with the CD rooms before so you would know that we uh, have a different kind of uh, you know uh, 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 CD room and DVD room if you have a CD room that actually cannot read the DVD but if you have a DVD room that can read both CDs and DVDs as well because the beam that we use in DVD that is actually different to uh, the beam we have for you know CD so uh, the capacity of DVD is much larger so that is uh, if you have a single sided single layer so a DVD uh, could have one layer or could have two layers as well if it is one layer that is 4.7 gigabyte and if it is two layer that is 8.5 gigabyte now normally if you have seen a CD so you have a you know single sided CD that uh, CD or DVD that only one side you have all the data but you may have a CD or DVD which uh, can write data or read data from both the sides as well the upper side or the lower side then in that case that will be double sided uh, you know uh, double sided DVD so we may have a double sided but single layer DVD so uh, then uh, the, the, the data that it can save that is 9.4 gigabyte and then we may have double sided dual layer so that could save up to 17 gigabyte normally we have single sided single layer DVD so that can save data up to 4.7 gigabytes okay next we have the subsystem that is uh, interconnection so how can we connect you know uh, different parts of the memory so one we have connecting CPU and memory then we have connecting uh, IO devices and we also have the addressing input and output devices so the interconnection actually plays an important role because the information needs to be exchanged between these uh, three subsystems so let us see uh, how can we do that so suppose you have uh, the CPU here and then you have memory so between CPU and memory we have three kind of buses we have the data bus, address bus and control bus so these are the connection through which they you know we basically share the information so data bus is used uh, for controlling the data between CPU and memory address bus is used uh, for telling which particular memory you want to you know get so the, the, the size of the address bus depends on how many addresses we have if we have 16 addresses so that means address would, would be 4 bits long if you have uh, uh, a data bus depends uh, uh, what is the word size here so if you have a 32 bit word size that data bus could be you know 32 bits so the, the greater the bits of the uh, data bus then that means uh, we can have faster data transfer and the control bus basically you know uh, controls whether we need to read the data from the memory or write the data from the memory what kind of instruction it is so how can we connect IO devices? So IO devices cannot be directly connected to the buses uh, uh, that connect the CPU and memory. So CPU and memory can be directly connected using these buses but IO devices cannot be directly connected. What is the reason? Because IO devices are actually electromechanical, they could be magnetic, optic devices. So for example we may have a monitor, it could be you know uh, uh, we may have a keyboard uh, so it could be electromechanical device and we may have a disk which could be magnetic we may have a ROM which could be optical CD which could be optical so the CPU uh, and the memory these are electronic devices so those can directly communicate but these one cannot directly communicate because they have different kind of composition then these are much slower speed than the CPU and memory so we need to have some kind of intermediary intermediary uh, device which can handle you know these differences so the speed at which these two work so they may not be compatible with each other so we need to have some kind of controller so we have some kind of you know uh, controller through which we actually connect the input output devices uh, to the buses 
so these uh, you know controllers or interfaces that we have they basically control how the data would be connected so for example if we have keyboard uh, we have monitor and all of these so uh, they connect to these buses using some kind of controller so we do have a bus here connecting to these control these uh, devices but not directly cpu is connected to memory directly using buses but cpu or memory are connected to these devices using some kind of controllers and why do we need controllers the reason is already explained so we have different kind of controllers that we have we have uh, you know sc SI controller uh, which uh, basically uh, uses this kind of uh, daisy chain configuration so we have multiple uh, devices attached to this controller and each device has its own ID so when the data is transferred then which particular data it should go to that actually depends on that what kind of ID has been transferred so if the ID is for example 4 that means we are actually talking about the scanner so data is uh, transferred to the scanner so the data that is connected that is transferred from CPU to the controller that is uh, transferred uh, in uh, through parallel connection and then it is uh, transferred to any one of the uh, devices that you may have and then uh, uh, these devices uh, they are in daisy chain connection but the, the there must be a terminator here uh, through which they should be connected so for example the last device that we have we have a terminator and then we have a terminator so these are connected to, 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 to close uh, this particular connection of the SC, SI controller so this is the SCI controller small computer system interface it is also called small computer system interface controller okay, then you have the fire wire controller so in a fire wire controller so it is basically normally connected in the form of a tree connection so you do have uh, all the devices connected but uh, generally it is connected uh, uh, serially rather than parallel so you have a serial connection with one of the you know devices and then uh, that is connected to the, the, the many other devices through a tree kind of uh, connection so this is more serial so uh, that is also a controller which is basically recommended by no IEEE so this is an IEEE standard uh, firewall controller another kind of controller is USB controller universal serial bus so the data in this case is also uh, connected serially so you might uh, you know have heard the you know USB uh, USB name before universal serial bus so this is a kind of controller through which you can connect your devices so for example you may have a mouse uh, USB mouse so you can connect it through the USB controller to the you know uh, to your computer and also through USB you can connect uh, your keyboard or uh, you may have a printer through USB as well and in old times you might have seen that the computer uh, the, the, the keyboard or monitor if they were connected uh, to uh, to for example a desktop system so they had a simple uh, you know they had a parallel kind of connector with multiple pins so that was used in old times nowadays we normally use the USB controllers so in a USB controller you normally have a root hub and then that could be connected that can connect you know up to many devices and then we can directly connect the devices to, to this use USB root hub controller and then uh, we can also hub, uh, connect another hub to this uh, USB you know root hub now the difference between this uh, root hub and another hub is the hub can have uh, you know um, can connect other devices and can connect another hub the role of device is just to get the data and transfer it while the USB controller root hub that actually you know processes the data as well while the hub is nothing more than uh, just a static device which simply takes the data and passes uh, the data to the next device it may be connected to so we can use the USB controller you know bus as well so addressing input output devices the CPU usually uses the same bus to read data from uh, or write data to main memory and I.O. devices. So since it uses the same bus to read the data or write the data, so how do we know that whether we need to write the data or uh, write the data? So that is basically in the form of instruction. So if the instruction uh, uh, you know, refers to the word in the main memory, so then that means that the data that we have uh, uh, that is between the main memory and the CPU, and then instruction also identifies that uh, 
whether the data is for the IO device or it is uh, for the main memory. So you could see the data that we have here or control or anything that could go either to the main memory or IO devices. So how would we know that whatever we are performing that needs to be performed on the main memory or any one of the IO devices. So there are different kind of standards or methods for it. So two methods that are popular are isolated IO method and memory mapped IO method. We'll go through both of these. So what is an isolated IO method? In an isolated uh, IO method, uh, you have the CPU, you have the memory and then you have the controller. The data between the CPU uh, and the memory or the controller that is transferred based on the instruction. So you have isolated instruction for both memory and the control, memory and the IO controller. Now, each IO controller will have its own memory and then we'll have memory here as well. The memory address that we use here in controller, it could be same as the memory address for the memory. So for example, we have 101 here and 101 here. So when you get an instruction from the CPU, the address might be same. And how would we know that we need to get to the address of the memory or address of the controller? That is basically from the instruction. So for example, we have different instruction for the memory and different instruction for the controller. So if we have instruction input with 101 address, we would know this is for IO devices because input is the instruction used for IO devices. And if we have the instruction read with 101 address, so we would know this instruction read is for memory. So that means we are referring to the address 101 in the memory. So in the case of isolated addressing, we basically have different uh, uh, we basically have different instruction for both memory and control. So that means in this case we will have a lot of instructions so because we have different instruction for the memory and different instruction for the controllers. But we may we don't need to share the address of the memory with the address of the you know controller. The other scheme that we have which is called the memory mapped uh, IO addressing. In this addressing uh, uh, the instructions are same. So we have the read uh, instruction for the controller and we have the same instruction for the memory as well. So instructions are same, but the addresses are different. So you could see the addresses in memory go from 101 to 64,000, but the addresses in the controller, they basically start after the addresses from here. So in that case, uh, basically, uh, the addresses of the memory, they need to be shared with the controller. So we cannot have the same addresses in the memory or the controller. But in this case, the advantage is we have less number of instructions. So, uh, so this is how the, 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 uh, we know that uh, whether the instruction we are performing that is between the memory or uh, the CPU or between the controller or the CPU. Okay, the next topic we have is the program execution. So the general purpose computers we have today they use uh, a set of instructions called uh, a program to process the data. So, uh, a computer executes the program to create the output data from the input data and the program and the data, all of these are actually stored in the memory. Now, uh, CPU normally it uses the machine cycles to execute the instructions which are in the memory and by one by one these instructions are fetched from the memory, these are executed. So a simple cycle that uh, machine cycle uh, consists of three phases the fetch phase where we fetch the instruction decode phase where we uh, decode the instruction to, to uh, you know move the data uh, correspondingly from memory to registers or registers to memory and the last is the execute where you have to execute the uh, instruction. So for example let's suppose uh, we have uh, any uh, operation in, written in the memory. So what do we have? We first have to fetch that particular instruction from the memory. So by fetching mean we mean that uh, we'll have the program counter which will be pointing to the instruction that we need to get. We'll get that instruction into the instruction register. So that is fetch. Now that instruction that we have that will be you know in some kind of language. So we have to decode that into binary language. So that is basically the decode phase where uh, you know we decode it. For example, the instruction could be that we need to bring the data from memory to registers. So we'll decode it and then we'll execute it. So if it is, for example, that's for getting data from the memory to registers, we'll get the data. Similarly, another example could be that you get a, a instruction, fetch an instruction from the memory. 
then you decode it and decode basically tells us that there are two registers in the uh, in the CPU the and you need to add the values of those two registers and save in some other register so that will be the execution part we'll go through the examples and then it will become clear so this is the machine cycle fetch decode and execute so you start from here you fetch decode execute then you get the next section fetch decode execute until you reach a hard instruction which means you need to what you need to stop okay so before we go into the details of fetch decode and execute uh, uh, since the commands uh, we use they require to transfer data from IO devices to CPU and memory because the input that we normally get the data that we get that is from an input device and similarly the output is also on to an output device for example we use keyboard to get the input and then we might you know do some processing of the input and then the output may need to be shown on the output uh, device now the operation of the C CPU be, must be synchronized with the uh, IO devices because CPU is much faster than the IO devices so how would uh, it uh, communicate with the uh, IO devices there are different kind of uh, synchronization mechanism we have the program IO uh, mechanism, interrupt driven IO mechanism and uh, direct memory access uh, controller mechanism. So this is the program IO controller mechanism. So in this case what does happen whenever you get any input output instruction. So for example that suppose that you uh, may have an input instruction that means you need to get input from the uh, input device that is for example keyboard and it may be output instruction that you need to have performed something now you need to uh, you know display it on the monitor or screen so this is the output instruction now in each of these uh, sections for example when you need to get input from the device uh, input from the input device so CPU is faster in getting the input but the input from the input device might come slower so in that case the CPU might have to wait till the input comes so in program IO uh, controller what has happened whenever you get any input instruction so for example we have an input instruction here so when you get input instruction so what does happen it simply starts the input instruction so it uh, goes down so you don't have to stop because you just started so it issues the IO command it issues the IO command to corresponding input or output device device might not be ready so when it issues the uh, you know the, that uh, command so it keeps on checking the device status that is it ready to give the input if it is not ready then it will keep on checking it will still wait so in this case the CPU is actually waiting so during the time when the device is not ready it is getting ready your CPU would actually be waiting for uh, it would be waiting for the uh, device to get ready and once it is ready it will transfer the data whether it is for display or it is uh, for getting the data from it so once it is ready so the transfer of the data would take place either from CPU to the device or from the device to CPU and then it will come back again again and uh, you know if there are multiple words which need to be uh, transferred then you know all of those uh, would keep on you know going so depending on what kind of instruction we have so if you have uh, the next instruction for example this is completed so then you stop and then you continue with the next instruction in the program and then if you encounter another input output instruction so then the same process would be repeated so in this case in program IO controller the problem is while the device is not ready the CPU is basically idle it is not doing anything we have interrupt driven IO controller in that case what has happened so this is the uh, you know, diagram for it so when input output instruction uh, is encountered so you start from here you issue the IO command to the device but while the device is not ready what do you do uh, do something else but monitor the interrupt so CPU would keep on doing some other operations which it, it may do and uh, during this time it keeps on you know waiting for the interrupt from the device so when the device is ready device basically sends an interrupt interrupt basically means it will send a signal that I am ready now ready for the transfer of the data so once it receives the interrupt after that you know the transfer of the word takes place so in interrupt driven uh, um, IO controller the advantage is that uh, the uh, CPU would not be idle while it is waiting for the interrupt uh, while it is waiting for the interrupt from the uh, device so it will be doing something okay another kind of uh, device that we have for uh, connection with the IO devices is DMA uh, control direct memory access control so in this case uh, 
uh, CPU basically does not control the transfer of the data from memory to the any device. Uh, the transfer from memory to device directly takes place, and that normally happens in the case of you know uh, those uh, I/O devices which are relatively faster. So we may have a disk which is you know a fast device, and then from memory to disk, uh, direct data can take place. So we have a connection here. For example, this is DMA. Uh, which uh, we have a separate controller in this case which is called direct memory access controller which is responsible for direct transfer of uh, data from memory to the disk or from disk to the memory. Now the only thing in this case is that the data that needs to be transferred from memory to disk or from disk to memory that is transferred on the same bus which is normally used by CPU to transfer the data from memory to CPU or CPU to memory. So it is sharing, it is actually sharing the same bus. So in this case, uh, the only thing is that uh, if the CPU is doing some kind of operation which requires memory, so that would have to be halted because the bus now needs to be used by direct memory access. So what has happened? For example, let's suppose a direct memory, uh, you know, a data needs to be transferred from memory to disk or disk to memory. Control unit uh, finds out, okay, this is what needs to be done. So it sends a message. So this is number one. It sends a message to DMA that this is something that needs to be uh, performed and while it sends the message while DMA gets ready control unit CPU would start doing something else and once it is ready it sends a best bus request that I need the bus for the transfer so during that time CPU would actually you know assign the bus to DMA that now this bus would be used by DMA and CPU will not do the you know any operation relating to bus so it, it might be idle during that time because it might need you know uh, in order to do something it might need uh, the, the the bus uh, to get the data from the memory or if it is doing something in the arithmetic logic, logic unit then it can perform so after the bus request uh, the DMA uh, once it knows that the bus is available so suppose it needs to get the data from disk and uh, transfer the data to memory so it will get the data from the disk that is this instruction and that data it will be saved in the buffer that is in available in DMA be, uh, because that data data you know is transferred to DMA so it needs to have uh, the buffer and it said, uh, sends the acknowledgement that uh, this particular data has been received now it transfers that block uh, of data to memory and then it may get the next data so it will keep on you know, doing this if there is more amount of data that needs to be transferred. So this is how the direct memory access uh, you know, takes place. Uh, so only the time when the uh, bus is busy the CPU might not do anything if it requires the bus. So this is the general diagram of DMA. So whenever input output instruction occurs it issues the IO command. Uh, and then uh, IO command to DMA so DMA might get ready during that time so it might do something but keep on monitoring the interrupt when DMA is ready it sends the interrupt and then after that it releases the access to buses and waits for the DMA to finish if it needs the bus and uh, uh, then since uh, uh, we are doing direct memory uh, transfer here and we are uh, assuming that this would happen when you have fast output device as well so it would happen very fast and once it is uh, DMA is finished with it it will send another interrupt that uh, it is it has finished the data transfer and then uh, you know it can continue the CPU can continue with the next instruction because now the bus is available okay then we have different kind of architectures that we use uh, for uh, you know the, the instructions that we use uh, uh, in CPU so we have uh, these kind of uh, different kind of uh, architectures. We have the CISC uh, architecture, we have RISC architecture, pipelining and parallel processing. So what is CISC? Uh, uh, it stands for complex instruction set computer. So in, in CISC what has happened that uh, we have a large set of instructions including complex ones. So for every instruction we, for every instruction that we want to do we will have a separate set of instructions. So we may have hundreds and thousands of instructions in this case. So in this case, uh, uh, programming is easy. Why? Because uh, if you want to do something for everything, there is a built-in instruction. You can simply use that particular instruction for doing that. So programmers uh, therefore do not have to write set of instruction to do complex tasks because for every task there is an instruction that is available. 
the only problem with this is that the circuitry that we need in order to perform the complex instruction that becomes very very complex so this is circuit is very complex to perform the complex uh, you know instructions now in the case of risk what do we have this is a uh, reduced instruction set computer so in this case we have a, a small set of instructions uh, that uh, we can use for minimum number of simple operations then to do a complex task complex operation we can use these small instruction to, to, to basically compile or com do a complex instruction so the program in risk uh, is more difficult because uh, you need to write the program you need to combine simple statements to write complex uh, to, to, to do complex tasks but in this case circuitry is uh, quite uh, you know simple uh, because it is designed uh, for small instructions and multiple instructions complex instruction could be performed by using multiple small instructions okay, then we have pipe planning uh, the pipe planning uh, is basically uh, uh, it, it tries to make the CPU more useful by implying it uh, during the phases it might be idle. So for example a computer is normally has three phases fetch, decode and execute. So while uh, normally it, all of these are done in uh, serially so that means first you do fetch then decode execute once you are complete with one instruction then you fetch the next instru instruction decode and execute. Now we can use pipelining to improve the throughput. So, so control unit can actually do two or three of these instruction uh, phases simultaneously. So uh, how can uh, it do it? Let us uh, see an example. So this is normal uh, instruction without pipelining. So first we have to fetch the instruction, then decode, execute. Once we are done with instruction one, then you get the next instruction, you execute that, then you go to instruction three. In the case of pipelining, once you fetch the one instruction and while you are decoding the first instruction you can actually fetch the next instruction from the memory and while you are executing the first instruction you can decode the second instruction and you can fetch the third instruction in the meantime so in this case you could see that you can do multiple instructions at a time so that will simply improve the throughput of your program Okay, so uh, that was what that was actually the pipelining where we can do multiple instructions at a time. In parallel processing, what do we do? We basically have multiple units for doing multiple operations. So traditionally, a computer had single control unit, single ALU, and single memory unit. With the evolution now, uh, uh, evolution in technology and drop in cost as well. So a single computer can have multiple control unit, multiple ALUs, and multiple memory units as well. So uh, this idea is referred to as parallel processing where you have you know multiple of these units. So depending on what do you have in multiple, uh, we have multiple kind of organizations. So we have single instruction stream, single data stream, a single instruction, multiple data, multiple instruction, single data, multiple instruction and multiple data streams. Let us go through these one by one. So in single instruction, single data, this is the one we already have studied. We have single control units single uh, performing uh, uh, processing unit which is the ALU and we have single memory unit as well. So this is the conf configuration that we normally use. So uh, instruction stream is here and single data stream that we have. So everything is done ser serially because we have you know each one of the units only once. In single instruction multiple data. So we have multiple data units here as well and multiple processing unit as well with our arithmetic logic units. So in this case control unit is only one but we have multiple ALU. So for example we may uh, give one signal but that control unit uh, that signal may go to multiple ALUs. Now for example we may give one, one instruction that is to add uh, values. Now in that case uh, 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 that instruction would go to actually three arithmetic logic units where uh, this arithmetic logic unit will perform the operation on this memory and the, 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 this one would perform uh, the same operation but now on different data because we, this is referring to a different memory unit and then this one might be performing the operation so the operation might be same but uh, it might be performed on different memory units so that is why it's called a single uh, instruction uh, uh, multiple uh, you know uh, memory unit so it is called single multiple data so the data memory units or the data units are actually multiple. 
So to operate on multiple uh, units, we need to have multiple processing units. The, the instruction would uh, still be single. Then we have multiple instructions, single data stream. So here we have, uh, you know, multiple instructions here. And uh, data is actually, uh, data stream is only one. So we have only single uh, uh, memory unit in this case. Now we rarely use actually this one. Uh, so this kind of organization is not used. Generally, we are interested in to multiple instruction, multiple data stream. This is the true parallel processing. The other ones were, you know, partially parallel, which are not practically used. So this is the one which is the which is called the pure parallel system, parallel processing system. Now in this case, we have multiple control units, multiple arithmetic units, multiple memory units as well. So each control unit might be executing different instruction and using different arithmetic logic units and different memory unit as well. So all of these are divided into multiple units. So parallelly we can you know, execute a lot of things at the same time. So that will say that will definitely increase the throughput. Okay, now we'll go through a simple computer to to uh, uh, see how a fetch decode and execute uh, would actually be performed. So this is a very simple computer. Practically, we do not have such kind of computer. We have much more complex computers. So this simple computer has three components: CPU, memory, and I/O subsystem. So this is our CPU with the ALU registers, control unit with program counter and instruction register. This is the memory which is uh, 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 which is connected to CPU through this uh, bus, and then uh, this bus basically has both the uh, data bus, the memory bus, uh, and the control bus as well. It is also con connected to the I/O devices. Now, the memory unit has uh, content 16 bits, so that means each one memory location has uh, uh, one word, which is two bytes. And then uh, we have address bit, which is uh, 8 bits. So basically, we have 2 raised to power 8, 256 memory locations. Each memory location has uh, 2 bytes, so 256 into 2. That means we will have 512 bytes in total stored in this memory. Now, uh, the 254 locations are used for the memory. And from these 254 locations, uh, some are used for the program and some are used for the data. So the first uh, uh, few memory locations, these are actually used for storing the program and the next memory location, these could be used for storing the data. And the last two memory locations, they are actually used for the keyboard and the monitor. So this is actually memory mapped I.O. system. We saw previously we discussed that we have uh, uh, two different kind of uh, systems. One was uh, where we were using uh, uh, different instructions uh, uh, for uh, the I.O. devices and the memory and the other was they were using the same instruction but uh, the memory was saved which was called memory mapped I.O. system. So here we are using the memory mapped I.O. system where the I.O. devices and memory they basically share the same memory so up to F.D. the memory is here and F.E. and F.F. the last two memory addresses which are used by the uh, input and the output device. Program counter, it is it basically points to the next instruction. So since we are just starting the program, so program counter would be pointing to the first memory location 00. And instruction register, initially it will be empty, it will not have any instruction. Um, so when we start, it will simply get the first instruction from the uh, uh, first memory location because the program counter would be pointing to that. So let us try uh, that uh, uh, see how you know the instruction is performed. So instruction set, uh, we will go through a very simple instruction set. Now, <coughs> in our case, because the contents are 16 bits, so that means uh, we will have what? We will have an instruction which will be 16 bits only. And if you are saving the data, the data would also be 16 bits because this is how we can save the data. So uh, the instruction that we have, it will have two parts, the opcode op or operation code and the operands. So the opcode specifies what kind of operation we need to perform and the uh, operand basically these are the operands on which we have to perform the operation. So how many opcodes we can have? Uh, okay, let us uh, try to see. So that depends how many uh, instruction when we want to have. So it says each instruction consists of 16 bits. So since we are getting instruction from here from the memory, we will get the instruction memory 16 bit. 
So that means each instruction will be 16 bits. And then it is divided into four four bit fields. The leftmost field contains the opcode. So the first four bits will contain the opcode. And the other three fields, they basically contain the operand or address. So since the uh, leftmost field, that is the first four bits, they, they, the first four bits, these contain the opcode. So that means we'll have two raised to power four number of opcode, which is 16. So we'll have 16 different kind of operations. So first four bits, these are used for opcode. The next 12 bit, bits, these are used for operand. So we have different kind of actually instruction types. So we may have uh, the 12 bits uh, into divided into four four bits. So now this could be a register, this could be a register, this could be a register. So that means we use four bits for a register. Why? If you look at the registers, how many registers do we have? We have 16 registers, R0 to R15. So that since we have 16 registers, each address of the register would be how many bits? It will be four bits only. So that is why we have four bits for one register here, because each register can be addressed by using four bits. So if we have three registers, then we will have four bits for one register, four and four. Sometimes we may have an operation, for example, move, where we want to move the data from one register to another register. So we don't need the last four bits in this case. So if it is gray, that means we don't need that. Okay, sometimes we may have uh, the um, only one register. For example, we want to increment the register or decrement. So we may need only one register. So we don't need anything else. Sometimes we may want to uh, move the uh, data from the register to memory. So that means we need the memory address here and register address here. So what is the memory address? The memory address is actually 8 bits long. So that means we will need 8 bits for the memory out of the 12 bits and last 4 bits for the register. And then we may want the data to be moved from memory to register. So the last 8 bits will be used for memory and this will be the uh, you know destination register. So the left hand one is actually your destination and the right hand one is basically your source memory. And we may have an operation where uh, uh, we may have a, a register address and we may want to do, for example, a shift operation. So N may specify how many bits need to be shifted and 0 or 1 may specify whether we need to shift towards left or we need to shift towards right. So these are different kind of uh, instructions that we may have. Of processing the instruction so during the fetch phase the instruction whose address is determined by the PC we get this instruction from the memory into instruction register and then we increment the PC so that it points to the next instruction during the decode phase the instruction in instruction register it is decoded and the required operands are fetched from the register or from the memory during the execute phase, the instruction is executed by the ALU and results are placed in the appropriate memory location or the registers. So let us try to see. So once the third phase is completed, the control unit starts the next cycle. So that means again, since PC is pointing to the next instruction, it will get the next instruction, then decoded, then executed. So this process will keep on continuing until we reach to instruction, which is actually the halt instruction. So uh, these are uh, different kind of instruction we have. So for example, if your code is zero, so we have nothing here. So this was the last instruction here. So we have the opcode which is zero. We have nothing here. That means we need to stop. If we have code one, so that means if the first four bits represent one, this is the load instruction. Load means we need to load the data from memory to register. So we go to the memory location, which is here represented by last 8 bits that is M5 we load the data from memory 5 location 5 to register RD which is your destination register if the code is 2 that means we need to move the data from register to memory from R5 to for example MD whichever register it headed we have if we have code 3 that means we need to add so now you have 3 registers here we need to add these 2 registers and save into RD if we have add F, that means these two registers have fractional values. We need to add these two and save in RD. 
If we have moved that means we need to content move the contents from one register to another. If we have not operator that means we need to take the not of this one and move to destination. If it is and that means we need to perform the and operation of these two and save into RD. And then similarly our exclusive R. If it is increment we have only one register which needs to be incremented. Decrement we need to uh, we have only one register which needs to be decremented. If it is rotate so we have register which needs to be rotated. Uh, rotated by how many bits that is specified by n left or right is specified by 0 or 1 and jump instruction simply tells us where we need to jump to some other kind of instruction rather than executing the next sequential instruction so uh, the register here we have if it is equal to uh, or not if it is not equal to or not then uh, pc is equal to n so that means we this is the jump instruction and we need to uh, the program counter to move to this particular address which is provided here in the end provided by these 8 bits here and if it is equal to R then that means uh, if it is equal to R then in that case it means uh, that uh, we simply have to move the contents of the memory location into R so that means it will actually be this particular instruction here uh, which is uh, the load instruction so let us see an example. Suppose we have a simple example A plus B. We want to add the two numbers and save the result into C. So let's see how we can do this. So first we have to get the uh, suppose uh, that the two integers that we need to add are saved into these memory locations 40 and 41. And both are 16 bits because every memory location has 16 bits. And the result is to be stored into memory location 42 which is also 16 bits. So we need to have these five instructions. First we need to load the data from memory location M40 which basically has A to register R0. Then we need to load the second instruction, uh, second data M41 into R1. Then once we have the data from these two then we will add these two and save the result into R2. And once we have the result into R2 the next instruction would be uh, so this was the load instruction then we have the store instruction so load is from loading from memory to uh, loading from memory to register and store is storing from register to the memory so this is the store instruction so we uh, store the data from the register to the memory because it was asked the result should be stored into memory location 42 so we store into memory location 42 and after that we simply stop so we need five instruction so this is the uh, you know op code for uh, this so op code is for example the code is 1040 so since it is load so that means first four bit will represent one then uh, we need to uh, move the data to register r0 so next four bits will represent zero here so that means this is the address of r0 then 40 because the memory location is 40 so we'll have 40 here so that means we need to move the data from M40 to R0 and uh, this tells us that this is actually a load instruction 1141 means again load instruction the first represents uh, you know what kind of instruction it is so you could go back and see that 1 actually means it is load so we load and uh, if it is load then that means we need to have destination register and we need to have the memory address so from which memory address M41 so that means we will have 41 here and we will use the next register R1 because we already have the data in R0 so now we can use the next register R1. We can actually use any one of the registers we are using R1 any register which has not been used before could be used. So we use R1 here so from memory to we move the data to R1. Next is we need to add. So since the two values suppose they are integer values so we'll use 3201. So that means we want to add integer values, save the result into register R2 and 0 1 means that we need to get the data from the register 0 and we need to get the data from register R1. So these two will be added. You already have saved the data here. Result would be saved into R2. So this is add. Now we need to store. So first store we will be using 2 here which means store. 4 means uh, uh, okay 42 means that we need to since it is stored so that means next 8 bits would be used for the memory 42 means that uh, uh, this is the memory location m42 and 2 means that we need to uh, take the data 
from this particular register. So we'll take the data from R2 and save into memory location M42. And now next we have 0000, 000, 000, 000 that means it is simply the heart operation. Okay, so storing program and data store the five line program into the memory. So now this program that we have here, that is 1040114132, this program needs to be saved into the memory location from 0000 to 00 from 04. Why? Because we have only five instructions. And why do we need to save it here? Because uh, the first memory locations actually, uh, these represent the uh, the first memory location these represent the program and these are the one for the data so the data is in 40 and 41 and the program is basically from 00 to 04 so we can go back so program will be saved from 000 to 004 because this is where the programs are located and data would be in 401 41 and 42 because that is the address that we use for data so one cycle per instruction so if we have a small program with 5 instructions, we need 5 cycle. Suppose we have these numbers which we want to add. This is the result that we want to save back into this memory location 42. So, uh, so these numbers are basically in hexadecimal. So these numbers are stored into the memory. So in memory basically has 16 bits. So it can be saved into hexadecimal. Each number is 4 bits. So this is hexadecimal notation. So let us see how this would be executed. So first we need to get this instruction 1040. So we can go back and see the first instruction was actually 1040. We'll get this instruction. Why? Because program counter is pointing to 00. So that means we need to get this instruction. So this instruction will get into IR. So this is the fetch instruction. So this is the fetch, fetch instruction. So first we need to fetch it from this memory location into here so that is the fetch instruction and after that we need to decode what does decode tell us number two is decode decode tells us that this instruction means we need to move from m40 to rd this is a load instruction we need to load the contents of memory location 40 into r0 why you could see that 1040 actually means this load m40 into r0 so we will load the data from 40 which is 00A1 and 00A1 is actually 161. So we will get this data from here to register R0. So we will get data here. So this is the, uh, so this was the decode. Next is execute, execute means now we need to execute this instruction which means we will move the data from here to here. So fetch means getting instruction from here to uh, Instruction register decode means finding out what does this instruction mean executing means in executing this instruction that means moving the data from memory to the register next instruction uh, was again the load instruction now we'll be loading uh, the next instruction from here to next data from uh, 412 or not now we'll be getting next instruction wow now why because now program counter is actually pointing to the next instruction it is automatically incremented, uh, incremented after the fetch instruction and after that the next instruction is that uh, uh, 3201 which actually means we need to add the register and save the result into R2 so we will be adding these two registers R0 and R1 and by arithmetic logic unit we will be performing the addition and saving the result back to R2 then the next instruction is we need to move the result that we have in R2 into memory location 42. So we'll fetch the next instruction, decode it and then move the data from here to the memory location 42. And after that the next instruction is basically 0000, 0, 0, 0 which means we simply have to halt, we'll stop here. So this is a, you know an example of a simple instruction. Now in this example we are actually taking the data from memory performing the operation on the data and saving the data back into the memory. Practically when we take the data, we normally do not take the data from memory. We take the data from an input device and when we write the data, we do not write the data to memory. We basically write the data back onto the device again. There is some kind of output device which could be monitored. So getting data via input device is normally called a read operation and we read the data from IO device. 
For sending data, it is called an write operation and we normally write the data not into the memory but on some kind of output device. So if you have input on output devices, then what will be the sequence then? So that means first we'll have to read an integer into M40. So now we started, in this case for example we had started directly by reading the data from M40 and reading the data from M40 into R0. But initially we will not have any data into M40. So that means first what we need to do, we need to read the data from the input device and save that into M40. Then we'll load M40 into R0. Then we need to read the next integer from the I.O. device uh, and read the data and save that into M41. And then we'll move the data from M41 to R1. Next we'll have the same operation. So after uh, we write the data from R2 to M42, we'll have to write the integer from M42 to the output device as well. So this is example, uh, practical example where we do. So this is how we do it. So normally what do we do? We, for example, let's suppose we need to read the data from the keyboard. So let us see what is the address of the keyboard. So the address of the keyboard is FE, the, uh, the address of the monitor is FF. So the address of output device is FF, the address of the input device is FE. So that means first we need to read the data from the keyboard. And the, uh, the, the keyboard, which is the output device, it is actually connected to the CPU, it is not connected to the memory. So that means we need to read the data from from the keyboard into the CPU and then from CPU to the uh, memory which is M40. So now coming back here, so first we read the data from MEF which was the address of our, uh, our uh, uh, input device which was the keyboard. So we read that data into R which is our register into the CPU and then from R2 we basically write the data into the memory. For the write operation we uh, move the data from memory to the CPU and then from uh, our register to the back to the memory. Now somebody might ask that you know when we are doing the operation let's suppose we execute the operation and we write the data into the memory and then to write the data back to the output device we read the data from memory to register and then from register to output device. We already have seen. So for example in the last uh, you know step what we did we wrote the data from R2 to the memory and uh, then to get the data back to the output device we read the data from here to register again and from register we write the data back to the output device. Now why do we do that because in this case we have you know only a few instructions but normally we will have a lot of instructions and in that case uh, uh, you know it may not be possible for the register to you know uh, hold the, all of the data so that is why we get the data from memory into register one by one and then uh, we actually transfer the data back. So the registers might be holding a lot of data. So we may not be possible to transfer the data directly back to the output device. We may have to temporarily save that into the memory. Once we are done with all the processing, then we read the data back into our registers and then get these data back to the output device. Okay, so now the program could be coded as this. So since now we have to you know, read the data from the memory, uh, from the output device, uh, to the register then from register to the memory so now you will have much more instructions so to do the same operation now we have to have how many instructions we basically have to have the four uh, 11 instructions the first four are for input the operation 9 and 10 these are for the output and in between these are actually the one uh, for the operation we already have you know seen these uh, uh, 1040 to 2422 so these were the one where we were doing all the operations now uh, the last two these are for the output operation, the first four these are for the input operation. So you can go through these instructions again by looking at you know this particular table and then you would know that how would these instructions basically execute whatever uh, is being executed. Okay, this is it for uh, you know for this lecture. So uh, we have discussed all the computer organization in this particular lecture. So these are very few small topics so you can go through all of these and if you have any question do let me know through the question and answer session. Thank you very much.